Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's discussion on the history, philosophy, biology, and social science of race. This is the second in a sequence of lectures that are supplementary material to my course at the University of Toronto on the philosophy of social science. So if you're really interested in the other videos that are part of this lecture series, you can go to the playlist section on my YouTube channel and have a look at HPS 300, Philosophy of Social Science. So a few disclaimers before we begin this discussion. The first is that this is obviously a very controversial topic. Notions of race are tied to problems related to racism and racist discourse. Um, secondly, not all biological conceptions of race entail racism. Some do, some do not. So it's really important that we look at a few different conceptions from biology about what race is and is not. Thirdly, uh, we're going to analyze the strengths and weaknesses of social scientific views about race. So social scientific views are informed typically by biology, but some diverge a bit. And we'll see exactly how that works in the time to come. Fourthly, we'll look at the role that social construction has to play in notions of race. So this is very much the philosophical content of this discussion that we're going to have in the latter half of today's discussion. So here's going to be a quick overview of what we're going to discuss today. First, we're going to get into the history, science, and philosophy of race. So we'll give a brief modern history of race. And then we're going to give a brief overview of the social science of race, proceeding to discussions of genetics of race, and then general philosophical questions about social constructionism and political theory in the context of race and racist discourse. To start off our historical discussion, we're going to discuss a bit of the activity that's happening in the 8th century in Northwest Africa and in Southwest Europe, particularly in the Iberian Peninsula region of modern-day Portugal and Spain. So in the 8th century, a group known as the Moors conquered Andalusia in 8th century, with Jews, Christians, and Muslims coexisting relatively peacefully. There's some conflict, etc., but comparatively peacefully. Whereas um, when the Spanish Inquisition uh, started to become active in this region in the 15th century onwards, Jews, Christians, and Muslims were forced to convert to Christianity or else face expulsion. And so in this case, the conversion led to distrust and people had to prove their lineage. So they had to prove that they were in some sense pure bloods, that they had a clear ethnic and, uh, well, there wasn't genetic at the time, but something kind of like proto-genetic lineage uh, going to their ancestry that could um, distinguish their ethnic and racial categories in a way that differentiates one from the other. Jumping to the late 15th century, we have notions of race being discussed in the context of the transatlantic slave trade. So, as everyone knows, Christopher Columbus lands at Hispaniola, modern-day Haiti, in 1492. So, kind of along with this time period amongst Spanish discourse is a debate about the morality of slavery and the alleged inferiority of so-called Indians, in big quotations. So, the big debate kind of is between Bartolome de las Casas and Guinness Sepulveda. And so between Sepulveda and de las Casas is the question about whether or not Indians, so-called Indians, I'm going to use this in quotation marks, uh, deserve to be enslaved or not, whether they're an inferior race. Um, it's very tragic that well over 12 million slaves are traded transatlantic-wise from Africa over 400-odd years by Portuguese, British, Spanish, French, Dutch, and Danish slave traders. Slavery, there's many reasons that slavery happened, but a lot of it was due to economic imperialism and various racist notions uh, concerning the inferiority of various ethnic groups and alleged racial groups um, is very much a, a part of this history as well. While there are many different theories of race and racism going back to ancient times, it would take until the 17th century for there to be more sophisticated views on race and ethnicity that would be informed by what we'd now call social and natural sciences. So in the 17th century, there was a raging debate between people who supported a view known as monogenism versus those who supported a view known as polygenism. So monogenism is essentially the view that says that all human beings, all races and ethnic groups, originally came from the same shared lineage. Polygenism says the opposite. It says that there were multiple different lineages operating in parallel, springing up in various different parts geographically on Earth. So according to the Bible, that is the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, uh, for those who are familiar with this, and also for those who are familiar with the Quran and a number of other holy texts, the thought is that all humans came from the same place of some kind. So we are all descendants of Adam, Noah, Abraham, etc. And that this is a view that is very clearly a monogenistic view, a monogenism view. Um, it would take until a thinker, Francois Bernier, 1684, in his book, A New Division of Earth, for there to be more discussion that would uproot monogenism's kind of mainstream um, belief. That is, most people believed in monogenism of some kind. Uh, Bernier introduced this idea that maybe actually people came from different kinds of races and that there are separate races. Uh, so we have the idea that there's a race of European, North African, Egyptian, Indian, and Persian people. So they, they form one group. Another group is those who um, have historical origins in the South 
south of the Sahara Desert geographically. A third group is those of East Asian types, modern day Koreans, Japanese, Chinese people, Thai people. And then there would be Northern Scandinavians, what we would now consider to be uh, essentially white people or Caucasian people of some kind. This being said, Bernier was not exactly apologinist. So it was actually unclear um, whether or not Bernier was a monogenist versus apologinist. The point being is that he's important in the history of ideas because he challenged the mainstream orthodoxy about monogenism. He got people thinking beyond monogenist lines. In the 18th century, that is the 1700s, Immanuel Kant, well-known philosopher, he advocated uh, monogenism by way of the following ethnic groups. So we have here North Europeans, East Asians, Black Africans, and Asians, and Indians. So you see that there's a slightly different categorization of racial groups in the work of Kant as opposed to that of Bernier in the 17th century. Um, we also have the work of Hans Blumenbach operating in a similar kind of time as Kant, and it would follow the Office of Management and Budget definition used by the U current U.S. government. So we'll look more uh, later about exactly how Blumenbach thought about this and its relationship to the OMB definition in a later point in our discussion. Obviously, conceptions of race and racism were very prevalent in the United States in the early half of the 19th century. In the context of social science and biology, the notion of phrenology was very popular as a means to demonstrate the alleged inferiority of people of African origins. Um, in the work of Orson Squ Squire Fowler, for example, um, phrenology was a method in which you would scrutinize the skull structure of people. So when I say the skull structure, I do not mean the entire head, including the brain. I mean literally just the skull. Okay, so forget about the brain, it's just the skull cavity itself. And so the thought is that in analyzing the skull, one would be able to determine um, the probability of a person having particular personality characteristics, whether or not they're a friendly person, a mean person, whether they're altruistic, whether they're corrupt, greedy, etc. And also the probability that they're going to commit crime and also the kind of just general overall moral dispositions. So phrenology was quite a popular means of using resources of biology and um, social science to show the alleged deficiencies in African Americans. Of course, we know now that phrenology is a highly discredited method of inquiry. Um, while there were some initial attempts to ground it based off of then known science, the scientific methods at the time were not particularly rigorous. For example, um, at the time, there wasn't good usage of things like carbon dating. Secondly, there wasn't a clear understanding of genetics whatsoever. So you had Mendelian genetics, but you didn't have the synthesis of natural selection and, um, and uh, Mendelian style genetics until the early 20th century. And you also didn't have a clear understanding of DNA structure or anything like this. So, so really, there wasn't much scientific basis that they had to go for this, uh, even though relative to the time, they were in some sense trying their best. Um, when I say trying their best, I do not mean in any way to justify um, the usage of phrenology at the time. Rather, I'm just trying to contextualize historically uh, the state of scientific research in the United States on phrenology and its understandings. It would take until the early 20th century or later 19th century for race-based eugenics to really become full-fledged and very popular and mainstream. So there's, there's different kinds of eugenics, right? So we have eugenics that is positive eugenics and negative eugenics. When I say positive eugenics, I do not mean to say that positive eugenics is a good thing. That is not the sense in which I mean the word positive. Same goes for negative eugenics. I do not mean to say that it's necessarily a problematic thing. Though, of course, you may and are likely to think that both positive and negative eugenics are harmful, uh, broadly understood. Um, of course, historically, they were quite harmful, but it remains to be the case whether or not there can be contemporary variants of negative eugenics or positive eugenics that could satisfy bioethical moral criteria. So putting aside the moral discussion in the contemporary scene, let's just go back again to the late 19th century and early 20th century debates on race-based eugenics. So in the context of this discussion, you have figures like Francis Galton, a British social scientist, Alfred Plotz, Houston Chamberlain, well-known British fascist and intellectual predecessor and big inspiration to Adolf Hitler, Hans Gunther, and obviously Hitler himself. And so in the context of race-based eugenics, this is where conceptions of race obviously had very important impact on deciding policy, on deciding um, how governments should be run, how society should be run, alleged inferiority of people, etc. And they were trying to draw upon a variety of anthropological evidence, historical evidence, and what little they could gather about um, then known biological evidence in favor of these claims. So understand that eugenics was actually quite popular in um, biology of the time. Like it's actually quite shocking to 
um, modern readers and um, people who are trying to study this history to understand that it was very popular. So even the Canadian government, for example, um, advocated sterilization programs. So again, to explain the difference between positive and negative eugenics, sterilization programs are an example of negative eugenics because you're trying to prohibit people from procreating of a certain kind um, and people with certain characteristics. Positive eugenics is saying that people who are um, high up in society, elite, or have elite characteristics of some kind, should be incentivized to produce further. Okay, so notice that positive eugenics and negative eugenics, you can be an advocate of one, but not necessarily an advocate of the other, and vice versa. And so in the context of both positive and negative eugenics, both were very popular at the time. So the thought is that athletes, very strong people, should be procreating. They should be incentivized to procreate, to create even stronger people. Smart people should be incentivized to create smarter people, et cetera, et cetera. They should be having sex with one another. And people who are considered so-called undesirables, uh, again, I do not express this view myself that these are undesirable people. I'm just saying that that is the terminology and understanding of the time. People who are disabled, people who are considered um, deviant sexually, maybe they have a non-binary gender identity or they have a sexual orientation that is bisexual, homosexual, etc., um, that these people should unfortunately not be allowed to procreate. And, and in many cases, uh, obviously in the case of Hitler and Nazi Germany, they should be straight up killed. And so it was very popular for conceptions of race to be grounded in various extant, that is, then accepted notions of biology and race and inferiority. And so anthropologists at the time, uh, not all, but there were some, who were quite active in trying to um, demonstrate the alleged inferiority of non-Hispanic white people, for example. And uh, there was just kind of a raging debate about race in the kind of general intellectual zeitgeist of Western Europe of this time. Like I said, not absolutely everyone agreed with these views. For example, the well-known anthropologist Franz Boas said the following in the mid-20th century. It is not justifiable to assume that the individuals that do not fit into the ideal local type, which we construct from general impressions, are foreign elements in the population, that their presence is always due to intermixture with alien types. It is a fundamental characteristic of all local populations that the individuals differ among themselves. Okay, so what is Boaz basically trying to say? As I understand what Boaz is trying to say is that when you form a racial stereotype, what you're doing is you're essentially generalizing from a finite sample of a particular ethnic or racial group. Okay, and you're trying to generalize to what the entirety of those people who allegedly fall under the same uniform category of that race or ethnicity. Secondly, Boaz is saying that, look, there's actually more differences between individuals within an alleged race than there are differences between races themselves. So, for example, if you look at someone who is a self-identifying Caucasian person, suppose that they're Northern Scandinavian, perhaps they're Swedish, for instance, they have genetic lineage going for 500 years to um, what would now be considered modern-day Sweden. Consider a person like this and consider someone such as myself. Um, I have genetic origins or at least long lineage going back to modern-day China, even though I'm raised as a Canadian national. And the claim is that if you were to sample any kind of random Scan northern Scandinavian and you were to sample a random um, East Asian, such as a Chinese person, there's actually going to be a lot more similarities between the general average between the characteristics, both psychologically, genetically, and physiologically between those two groups, um, whereas there's going to be much more differences between um, any two randomly chosen Chinese people or any two randomly chosen Swedish people. Okay, so I'll just say that one more time so that's really clear. Um, the phenotypic differences between that and the general physiological and psychological characteristics between any two individual Swedish people is more likely to be different than are the differences between any Swedish person and any randomly selected Chinese person. That is at least the claim of what Franz Boas is trying to say here. Like I said, the history of genetics took a very long time to develop. The DNA structure wasn't uh, discerned until about the 1950s in, in England, specifically Cambridge, England. And so you have notions of genetics that were still inchoate. They were not very well developed. And it followed that various conceptions of biology that were related to race also were very faulty and problematic. They did not have rigorous scientific support. In fact, a lot of those views were wholesale overturned. Okay, so you'd have to study more about the history of biology, of which I'm not an expert, but I knew a decent amount, uh, to understand more about how complex that history is. And I mention this because it shows you that scientific revolutions occur quite frequently. And what we used to think is the case is no longer the case, and maybe even what we think now is the case. In the future, biologists will look back on the present time and think, okay, you guys also were totally mistaken about how biology and how human beings work. And I mention this because modern biologists say that racists cannot be pure. That is, there seems to be very little genetic evidence that there is such a thing as a Chinese person, that there is such a thing as a Ghanan person, that there is such a thing as a Chicano, or there is an Argentinian, or a French person, etc., etc. Rather, races are 
at best vague cluster concepts for people that share genetic material. And we'll talk a little bit later in the context of modern day cladistics research as to how exactly the science of that goes. But it's important to note that modern biologists typically reject old school conceptions of race that were typically used to justify racist policies, whether it be slavery, whether it be oppressive class structures, whether it be economic relations, etc., etc., etc. Um, there's also a consensus amongst a lot of social scientists that environmental factors are a significant component of what it is that influences a person's psychology, their beliefs, and their moral behavior in general. So there is um, some evidence for heritability of factors such as intelligence and personality, um, obviously physiology, um, but the extent at which environmental factors have more influence versus heritable factors is still a raging debate in social science and in modern biology. Um, Another thing to note is that monogenism is strongly empirically supported. So you have the so-called out-of-Africa theory, and the out-of-Africa theory is that um, many hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago, we have genetic lineage sharing between that of other uh, hominid creatures. So homo sapiens, that is the technical term for, for humans, uh, we evolved uh, essentially out of regions of southern Africa region, otherwise known as modern uh, Botswana, essentially. Uh, so in the kind of modern Botswana region, you have the so-called uh, mitochondrial Eve, which we'll discuss in a moment, um, which is supposed to be the first homo sapien or first modern day human being of some kind. And again, there's lots of evidence that we share genetic material with um, ancient hominid creatures known as Denisovans and Neanderthals. So we'll talk a bit in a moment about the evidence for that. It's important to discuss the basics of ancient DNA methodology. So within a cell, you have mitochondria and you have so-called mitochondrial DNA within the mitochondria itself. And scrutinizing these biological entities, uh, the human genome was first sequenced in about 2001 or so. So you have a complete mapping of the human genome. And the method is to use what's known as a polymerase chain reaction technique. So first you have to construct a so-called clean room, a completely sterilized empty room. Um, you then have fossils, that is hominid fossils, whether it be Denisovans, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, etc. And you need to do this because you need to avoid fungi and bacteria from biasing the PCR technique uh, methods. And so scrutinizing the mitochondrial DNA will allow you to understand the genetic lineage, specifically along the mother's line, um, about the evolution of hominid creatures. So looking at this method in a little bit more detail, we can look at a recent book by the Harvard geneticist David Reich. Uh, David Reich wrote a book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, which is a story of ancient genetics and using genetics to understand the ancient origins of hominid creatures such as ourselves. So looking here at figure five from his book, how we can tell how long it has been since our genes shared common ancestors. The first part is to look at the following. Each of us has two genomes, okay? One from our mother, one from our father. Some segments are more alike than others. The more differences or mutations in a given segment, the longer it's been since the gene copies bequeathed to us by our parents shared a common ancestor. So as you can see by these strands of DNA here in the picture underneath number one, you see mother's DNA is on the top, you see father's DNA is on the bottom. You have ACTG, which are the four building blocks of genetic DNA material. And so you see on the left-hand side a segment with few differences where you see those two red arrows pointing to the AC and TA. So those are differences here. And it indicates a short time since sharing a common ancestor, for example, about 50,000 years ago. Whereas you look on the right-hand side of figure five under number one, you see the segment with many differences. So you have AC, CG, AT, CG, AC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that indicates a long time since sharing a common ancestor, for example, about one million years ago. The second part of this process is to note that for any pair of non-African genomes, that is genomes that don't have geographical locality in that of the Af modern African regions, more than 20% of individual genes share a common ancestor between about 90,000 and 50,000 years ago or so. So this reflects a population bottleneck when a small number of founders, that is a small number of people who are having lots and lots of children, gave rise to many descendants outside of Africa living today. And so there's lots of genetic evidence for this. And so you can look at genetic, excuse me, uh, David Wright's, Reich's book on uh, genetics for more on that. I actually have a full YouTube video on this. So if you look at my YouTube channel, you can look at my book summary of David Reich's book to understand a bit more of these details. So the probability that a pair of genomes share a common ancestor at this time can be understood by this graph. Um, so for a while, there's going to be low probability that a pair of genomes share a common ancestor. And then all of a sudden, there's a large bottleneck happening about uh, 90,000 to 50,000 years ago, as you can see uh, underneath number two on the bottom right hand side of this figure. 
And so about approximately 24% of sequences have shared ancestors for non-Africans and about 1% for Africans in this period. Zooming out for a moment, it's important that we contextualize the history of humanity relative to other hominid creatures in our ancient history. So about 70 million to 5 million years ago, there was a kind of split from the ancestors of chimpanzees. So we share a lot of genetic material from chim chimpanzees. That's not to say we so-called descended from chimpanzees. Rather, we share a common ancestor. Next is that um, there's evidence from a fossil known as Lucy, an upright Australopithecus, located in the Awash Valley of Ethiopia, dated to about 3.2 million years ago. Okay, so Australopithecus is another um, hominid creature of which we share genetic material with. 1.8 million years ago, there's fossils of hominids outside of Africa, uh, such as in modern-day Georgia, the Eastern European country of Georgia. About 770,000 to 550,000 years ago, uh, there's genetic estimates of a population separation between Neanderthals and modern humans. And so it turned out to be the case that actually um, many people had, um, that is many homo, homo sapiens, that is modern to humans such as ourselves, actually interbred with Neanderthals, which is very fascinating. So Neanderthals are much stronger, more muscular creatures than we are. They're a lot less intelligent um, and they're a very different kind of hominid creature, but there is evidence that we actually share genetic material. As much as 2% uh, in some cases of people in um, Eastern Europe and, and, and parts of the Middle East actually share uh, genetic components with that of uh, Neanderthals. We'll talk a bit about Denisovans a later on, as there were Denisovans, of which interbred with um, ancient humans as well. So people in, in China uh, with Chinese origins also have genetic material sharing with that of Denisovans, which is another hominid creature. As I mentioned before, the more mutations that you have, the less likely you are to be genetically related to someone else. And I mention this because in analyzing mitochondrial DNA, you're able to estimate the rough point at which divergences between genetic ancestors occurred. And so the less DNA shared, the further back you go, um, the more that you can see that there's divergences between lineages. So the methodology of this is to scrutinize the total fragment of DNA from your parents given certain generations. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the mathematics here of genetic divergence. So basically, you have 71 pieces of DNA that are shared um, between your mother and your father. So 23 come from each parent, uh, one from mitochondrial, um, that is 23 plus 23 plus 1 is equal to 47. So that's how you get 71x plus 47. So where does the 71 come from? Well, the 71 comes from your mother transmitting 45 splices of DNA from their ovaries and your father transmitting about 26 splices from their sperm. And so the mathematical equation, where x is the number of generations going back into your uh, genetic ancestry, uh, you can calculate roughly how many pieces of DNA that you share with an ancestor from that time. So to use one example, let x equal 10, so that is we're going back 10 generations. So your grandparents' generation, excuse me, your parents' generation is one generation back, grandparents' generation is two generations back, your grandparents' um, uh, parents, that is your great-grandparents, is three generations back, so on and so forth. So let x equal 10 generations, so we're going 10 generations back back. And plugging it in to our simple mathematical model, we have 71 times 10 plus 47, which is equal to 757. Okay, so we share about uh, 757 uh, slices of DNA have been transmitted across those 10 periods. However, the number of ancestors you have, if you think about it, going back 10 generations, is vastly more. Okay, so the number of actual ancestors you have actually diverges from the amount of genetic material that you share from those ancestors. And that's very important to understand because that means that you actually don't share much genetic material even though you have ancestors. Okay, so that's that. I'm going to pause and repeat that because it's really important to understand this. Again, the amount of genetic material that you share with your ancestors starts to de decrease much more rapidly than the total number of ancestors that existed in your ancestral lineage. Okay, so if you think about it, every generation there's going to be two times as many people, right? Because there needs to be two people that created me, mother and father. There needs to be two people for, for my mother, that is their mother and father, and my father's mother and father. So that's four people. And so two to the power of ten, that is if you go back ten generations, you're going to have as many as 1,024 ancestors that are ancestrally related to you, but the amount of genetic material that's actually passed on from those ten generations is vastly less. It's only 757 pieces of DNA. Now, the reason this is so important is because that if you're going to have conceptions of purity of blood or purity of race, you're going to see that there seems to be very little basis for this from the perspective of modern genetics. To use a quote from David Reich's book, uh, Queen Elizabeth II of England almost certainly inherited no DNA from William of Normandy, who conquered England in 1066 and who is believed to be her ancestor 24 generations back in time. 
This does not mean that Queen Elizabeth II did not inherit DNA from ancestors that far back. It, rather, it means that it's expected that only about 1,751 of her 16,777,216 24th degree genealogical ancestors contributed any DNA to her. Okay? So, again, there's a vastly larger amount of gene genealogical ancestors compared to the amount of DNA that's actually transmitted. To quote Reich again, this is such a small fraction that the only way William could plausibly be her genetic ancestor is if he was her genealogical ancestor in thousands of different lineage paths, which seems unlikely even considering the high level of inbreeding in the British royal family. So again, just to quote Reich's first sentence in this passage, Queen Elizabeth II of England almost certainly inherited no DNA from her ancestor, William of Normandy. Having summarized modern genetics of race and biology, we now get into the discussion of what race is and how it has been defined in biology, philosophy, and in social science. So the first kind of naive conception of race that you probably have, that I probably have, that many people probably have, and that throughout history many people have had, is that race can be defined uh, as a categorization of humans into groups based on the alleged following shared factors. Biological genetic factors, that there's discrete groupings of people, that is, there's a discrete difference between alleged black people, alleged white people, alleged Asian people, alleged Native American people, etc. Thirdly, that there are these characteristics that distinguish these groups are inherited. Fourthly, they can be geographically localized and specified. And fifthly, there are observable phenotypic traits, that is, how it is that our DNA and genes express themselves in an organism such as myself or yourself, um, that allow us to distinguish these different kinds of racial categories. Again, I mentioned that race is distinct from ethnicity. So ethnicity is going to be defined as groups with shared culture, language, religion, and often but not always genetic background. Okay, so it's important to note that ethnic groups don't necessarily need to share genetic background, whereas race, according to naive conceptions, have to share genetic background and similarities. So according to this definition of race, which we'll call the classical definition of race, the classical definition of race is actually agreed upon by the U.S. Office of Management and Budget, the so-called OMB, um, ever since 1997, and it's actually employed in its so-called decennial census category. So every 10 years, the U.S. government is interviewing American adults and families as to their racial um, origins and their racial identification. Now, these racial identifications are actually self-identification. So it's not like geneticists are coming into people's homes and intrusively taking DNA swabs and tests, asking people what their DNA is. Rather, they're asking people to self-identify along the following categories. So here are the categories that are accepted by the U.S. government um, ever since 1997 that are still used today. The categories are American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, and so-called white people. So when you first think about this, you might think to yourself, okay, this is a really coarse-grained analysis of race. Why only these six groups of people? Um, on what basis does this have any bearing on social reality or biological reality? Um, are these just intuitions that they had? Why did they come up with these groups? Um, as we'll see, um, there's going to be various arguments for and against this grouping. Some are based upon so-called cladistics data in genetics. Some are based upon um, intuition and common usage of these terms. Uh, thirdly, there's some basis in the history. And fourthly, uh, there's going to be some who argue that there's no basis whatsoever for this categorization. So we're going to get into this debate in just a moment. So given this division of people into these races, um, about 24 million people identified as Asian in a 2020 uh, paper. Um, and a lot of these conceptions of race have been used because you want to enforce things like civil rights laws and anti-discrimination laws. Okay, so I mentioned self-identification of Asians because I'm just showing you that depending on how it is that race is exactly defined, how one considers Asians, so for example, are Afghans Asians, are Iranians Asians, how far west do we have to go for a group to no longer be considered Asian, are um, Iranian or Saudi Arabian people just as Asian as someone such as myself, which has genetic origins in modern-day China. Um, all these kinds of things are, are really important, but all that really matters is that it's the self-identity of a person that matters for the U.S. government. And I mentioned again that conceptions of race are very important to be used um, in the eyes of the government because there's going to be attempts to enforce civil rights laws and anti-discrimination laws. And um, there's also going to be usages of race to understand medical statistics related to medical research. 
Um, however, to quote well, one scholar, uh, the categories represent a social political contract designed for collecting data on the race and ethnicity of broad population groups in this country and are not to be understood as anthropologically or scientifically based and rigorous. Okay, so the OMB itself is saying that even though they're drawing a bit upon anthropology and biological conceptions of race, ultimately they are not fully grounded in um, modern anthropology and in modern biology. And I mention this because it shows you how complex are the debates about the extent at which anthropology, biology, psychology, and other social and natural sciences can have an influence on um, demographic and medical definitions of what race is. And so the OMB, that is the U.S. Office of Management and Budget, responsible for the U.S. Census, they actually consulted the public in a sequence of workshop hearings in 1993 and 1994 in order to construct the six-part racial categorization I mentioned earlier. As I mentioned, there's a lot of debate about to what extent the OMB definition is satisfactory in any way, whether it be anthropologically satisfactory or biologically satisfactory. So a few problems is, um, we, you know, we can just start with the obvious one, which is, is an Irish person as white as an Egyptian person? At least according to the OMB definition, um, they are just as white. They fall under the same category. Um, that certainly seems to defy common sense. It certainly seems unintuitive. It certainly doesn't speak to the racism at which people from the Middle East and Northeast African regions, uh, amongst other groups, uh, face. Um, it certainly doesn't seem that Egyptians are classified intuitively as white people by average people. Um, so what's going on here? Why do we even use this concept of, of, of race uh, understood to be white, homogenizing all people from the Southwest Europe in Iberian Peninsula region? In Portuguese, Spanish, all the way through to Czech people, to Greek people, to Italian people, to Finnish people, and Southeast all the way to um, Egyptian people. So if it's not biologically or anthropologically based, then really what is it based on? And so this is why you have actually the American Anthropo um, excuse me, A American Physical Anthropology Association, the AAPA, saying, well, look, racial categories do not provide an accurate picture of human biological variation. Variation exists within and among populations across the planet, and groups of individuals can be differentiated by patterns of similarity and difference, but these patterns do not align with socially defined physical groups, that is, a continentally defined geographic clusters of human beings. Okay, so I mention this because the American Physical Anthropology Association is actually has a consensus view assigned by numerous hundreds of academics in physical anthropology, claiming that the racial categorizations as used by the OMB are only really useful for demographic purposes. They are not useful <clears throat> for biological and medical purposes in the way that the OMB believes that it should be used for. This, however, does not mean that there is no basis for a medical or biological basis for racial categories whatsoever. It is just to say that the AAPA is criticizing the OMB definition and that the OMB definition is unsatisfactory. Having talked a bit about what the American Association for Physical Anthropology has to say about this, let's turn now to discussing what biologists actually think about race. So famously, Richard Lewontin, then a professor at Harvard in the 1970s, um, argued in a 1972 paper that there are seven races. However, amongst these seven races, of which they include West Eurasians, Africans, East Asians, South Asians, Native Americans, Oceanians, and Indigenous Australians, that 85% of the variation in protein types could be adequately accounted for by differences between individuals rather than division between groups. So this is really important because it's claiming that the differences between any randomly selected Swedish person and any randomly selected Fijian person, those differences are going to be a lot more similar, that is, between randomly selected Swedish and a Fijian person, than between any two given Swedish people and any two given Fijian people. So I'll say that one more time because it's counterintuitive to common sense, but it is empirically rigorous. The claim is that the differences between that of any randomly selected Swedish person and any randomly selected Fijian person or randomly selected native Canadian person and any native um, uh, person who has genetic origins to um, Finland, for example, that um, within each of these groups, there's going to be more variation within the groups than there is going to be between these groups. So that is what is meant by Lemonton's claim that 85% of the variation in protein types could be adequately accounted for by differences between individuals rather than division between groups wholesale. To cite another biologist published 2013 by Cooper in a paper, because most common diseases result from chronic exposures to noxious environmental stimuli, 
And because the pattern of exposure to the entire gamut of environmental exposures is highly structured by social class, geography, and other historical factors, disentangling an intrinsic property of race from the sum defect of poorly measured or unknown external risk factors is generally not feasible. So what is Cooper trying to say in this 2013 paper? Cooper is trying to say that there's going to be a confluence of factors from both genetics and from the environment. Now, the distribution of the effects that go towards impacting the phenotypic differences, that is the observable traits of an organism, such as humans, are going to be influenced by both the environment and obviously genetics, but that the environmental factors are a lot more responsible for describing differences of social class, geography, and other historical factors that affect the human organisms compared to the genetic factors. So it's a lot more difficult to A, separate them, and B, that the environmental factors actually have more impact on what is responsible for medically salient differences with respect to diseases. So if you look at the incidence of prostate cancer amongst African-American males, for example, they are as much as twice as much more likely than are um, other kinds of racial or ethnic groups uh, to have prostate cancer. And that, that difference is supposed to be explainable more by the circumstances under which African-American males typically work or live in, as opposed to it being responsible for genetic factors. So that's just one example of how environment can have more of a contributing cause to the disease uh, results and a general kind of epidemiology pertaining to medically salient features of human organisms compared to the genetic factors that influence those things. Cooper continues in the paper by writing, all of the major causes of disability and death in the United States occur more frequently in blacks than in whites, with the exception of lung disease and suicide. Although all of these conditions have been analyzed from the basis of racial predisposition, none have been more central to the discourse about race and health in North America than hypertension. So again, the claim here is that self-identified blacks or self-identified African-Americans are more likely to face disability and death in the US compared to that of so-called white people, people self-identifying as white in a racial category. And again, that these dispositions that we've noticed in data sets are more likely due to noxious external stimuli, that is harmful effects of the external environment, as opposed to straightforwardly genetic factors. Another biologist who shares a kind of similar view is Templeton. So writing again in 2013 to quote, adaptive traits such as skin color have frequently been used to define races in humans, that is the outwardly displaying phenotypic features of the genotype, but such adaptive traits reflect the underlying environmental factor to which they are adaptive and not overall genetic differentiation. And different adaptive traits define discordant groups, that is groups that have lack of similarity to each other. There are no objective criteria for choosing one adaptive trait over another to define race. As a consequence, adaptive traits do not define races in humans. So what is Templeton basically trying to say? Is that, again, your naive conception of race and perhaps ethnicity, well, let's focus on race for a moment, is that race can be distinguished by physical features, whether it be different shaped noses, ears, mouths, um, skull structure, whether it be about athletic facility, whether it be the color of our skin, etc., that this is not a good way to differentiate races insofar as there was any basis for race to begin with. Because biologically speaking, there is such tremendous diversity amongst these sorts of things that it isn't clear that you can demarcate cleanly off the basis of the genetic lineage of organisms, human organisms in particular, um, that they can be categorized um, and correlated with the phenotypically observable features that they have. So to say that one more time in a bit more plainer language, uh, you look at me, you think, okay, this guy's got darker skin. Um, I look to have visible traits that are East Asian in some sense, maybe Chinese, maybe Thai, etc. cetera. Um, but um, if you were to try to categorize people on the basis of these kinds of features, you're going to fail. You're going to actually more likely than not, make errors as to the geographical locality of each of these individuals, myself included, um, than if you were to look at other features, perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps looking at the genotype as opposed to the aspects of the phenotype. And again, Templeton is trying to draw upon other aspects of biology to inform conceptions of race, by which he means that naive classical conceptions of race are very problematic because they don't fit cleanly into other biological taxonomic categories that biologists employ all the time. So to quote Templeton, the subdivision of a species into groups or categories is not unique to our species. Since evolutionary biology deals with all life on this planet, biologists need a definition of race that is applicable to all species. A definition of race that is specific to one human culture at one point of time in its cultural history is inadequate for this purpose. So if you think about it, Templeton's making a really, really good point. 
if it's actually true that humans can be categorized into races, it follows that by biological necessity, all other organisms on planet Earth must also be categorized into something like races. After all, there's nothing special about humans that makes us categorizable into races. That is, there is a naive intuitive conception of race that we all have, and that we, we, well, maybe not all of us have, but we, a lot of us typically use and have a, a conception of intuitively. Um, but if, there, if that was to map onto cleanly and rigorously onto a set of biologically real categories, that those biologically real categories would not plausibly be unique to that of human beings. That is, if there were racial categories in the way that we understand them, and if they actually map cleanly onto genetics through cladistics, etc., then we would actually expect other species such as dogs, wolves, chickens, even plants such as trees, um, viruses, uh, raccoons, fungi, to also exhibit features of um, subspecies that could be defined along the lines of race. But because that isn't plausible, um, uh, through uh, empirical evidence, we, we have this. Because this is not plausible, it follows that our naive conception of race also isn't plausible and not biologically grounded. So to see this in more detail, uh, to quote Templeton again, adaptive traits such as skin color have frequently been used to define races in humans, but such adaptive traits reflect the underlying environmental factor to which they were adaptive and not overall genetic differentiation. And different adaptive traits define discordant groups. And as he italicizes and really emphasizes throughout the text, there are no objective criteria for choosing one adaptive trait over another to define race. As a consequence, adaptive traits do not define races in humans whatsoever. So despite looking at Templeton's view, we might think that this conversation is a lot more complicated than maybe Templeton's making it out to be. I mean, Templeton is a well-esteemed tenured professor of biology at an esteemed university. Um, but let's look into what are some other views and other things that might uh, not exactly challenge or problematize the claim, but are other factors that we should consider into any analysis of the biological basis for race. So notice that 20% of West African populations have one sickle cell mutation and about 1% have two copies and often die in childhood. Um, so sickle cell anemia, for example, is particularly uh, prevalent amongst West Africans. And we'll talk a bit in a moment about uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this adaptive trait. Um, there's evidence that uh, sickle cell mutations evolved independently in three distinct regions of West Africa, suggesting the result more of natural selection occurring. And as I mentioned before, uh, prostate cancer occurs about 1.7 times more often in African Americans than in Europeans. Um, to quote, uh, this particular disparity has not been possible to explain based on dietary and environmental differences across populations, suggesting that genetic factors might play a role. So um, I believe this quote is from David Reich's book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, published 2018. So this is not a quote from Templeton's paper. As I mentioned, West Africans are disproportionately affected by sickle cell anemia and sickle cell mutations. So what does this look like? Well, this looks like a disease that affects red blood cells. And it's called sickle cell anemia because it has a kind of sickle cell looking um, geometric shape, as you can see from the blue arrows. Look very carefully here. And um, the reason that this evolved, although there aren't clear essences or reasons uh, in evolutionary biology, but an explanation rather, to use more precise terminology, for why sickle cells mutated is because they have an adaptive advantage by allowing people with this um, disease to actually reduce the probability that they get malaria. Uh, so sickle cell anemia has the negative consequence of, in some cases, killing people um, from birth, um, and also obviously having anemic issues, so iron deficiencies, but also confer the adaptive benefit of having resistance to malaria through mosquito bites, etc. So that shows you that um, there seems to be some uh, genetic basis for certain conceptions of race insofar as um, there are a group of people, uh, of which there are millions, in West Africa that have this particular genetic mutation that confers these strengths and weaknesses to adaptive traits. And um, we have some evidence that um, people who are self-identifying these regions have these traits. So that shows that certain conceptions of a naive category of race map more cleanly onto that of the biological reality underpinning that. This being said, this is controversial, and um, medical geneticists um, do not converge in their opinion about exactly how the conception of race works in this context. It is just to say that there is a geographical region of planet Earth that has people who have a disproportionate frequency of this mutation genetically that produces sickle cell anemia and has the adaptive advantage of avoiding malaria. It's worth noting uh, another 
salient feature of the distribution of genotypes in African-American populations. So a study conducted in 2006 did a genome analysis of 1,597 African-American men, and they noticed that this group exhibited on average approximately 2.8% more African ancestry than other groups in their genomes, uh, of which is partially responsible for higher incidence of uh, numerous diseases, including prostate cancer, uterine fibroids, late-stage kidney disease, multiple sclerosis, low white blood cell counts, and even type 2 diabetes. And I mention this because it shows you that conceptions of race are actually used commonly in medical genetics. This is not to say that just because they're commonly used that they're justified. That is not what the claim is. Uh, there are some who do claim this, but I'm not necessarily claiming that, nor are others. Nor is it necessary to be the case that just because you use a certain conception of race, that it is justified, even if it is widely used in certain circumstances. To quote David Reich's book, Who We Are and Who We Got Here, again, he is a Harvard geneticist, uh, the odds of seeing a rise in African industry this large by accident were about 10 million to one. And so his claim is that there's going to be some kind of um, genetic event that occurred in the ancient history of uh, whether it be uh, um, uh, West Africans or, or South Africans or, or some region of Africa that led to this kind of disposition. Um, to clarify, Reich is not discounting, and I want to make this really clear, he is not a genetic determinist necessarily. He's not saying that the only thing explaining the higher incident of prostate cancer, uh, late-stage kidney disease, and type 2 diabetes amongst African males is genetic. He's not saying that. He's not saying that. Let's really make that clear. He's just saying that there are genetic factors that do contribute as a cause to what makes this happen to these groups. Okay, so he's not ruling out environmental factors such as harsher working conditions, other structural racist factors that lead African-American males to suffer from uh, various diseases or hardships in general. He's just saying that there are genetic components that um, can partially explain some of this uh, medical phenomenon. As Reich says, it is now undeniable that there are non-trivial average genetic differences across populations and multiple traits, and the race vocabulary is too ill-defined and too loaded with historical baggage to be helpful. So this makes really clear that despite all the past few slides where Reich is talking about medical genetics and talking about race and self-identifications of racial categories and their correlations with certain propensities for uh, medical diseases, etc., he is still saying that classical conceptions of race that I described before are nonetheless too ill-defined and too loaded with historical baggage to be helpful. And so that's really important because it shows you that medical geneticists, and again, Reich is a very prominent medical geneticist operating at Harvard University, um, shows you that classical conceptions of race are not justified, and therefore racism and discrimination is not justified on the basis of this medical genetics research. Rather, Reich calls for the need for a new concept of race that is genetically and anthropologically respectable for medical purposes. And Reich is a bit more controversial on this point in particular, and this is not a mainstream opinion, what I'm about to say, in saying that we actually need a new notion of race, because if we don't, that is, if we just avoid racial categories altogether wholesale, just reject every notion, period, that actually opens a vacuum for pseudoscience about race. So whether you're left-wing or right-wing, uh, typically right-wing people are more predisposed to have views about racial essentialism and uh, to hold various kinds of racist views. Um, the concern that Reich has is that, well, if we just jettison and remove and just destroy all conceptions of race whatsoever, we're going to be left in an indefensible intellectual position. We're going to be in a position where we're going to ignore genetic correlations that occur for certain kinds of alleged racial groups um, that uh, need explaining. They need explaining why it is that African-American males uh, suffer disproportionately from things like prostate cancer and type 2 diabetes. Now, Again, he is not saying, and I want to make this clear again, that that is a sufficient explanation for what it is. That is, genetics is not the whole story for why this is happening. So even these harmful diseases that these people are being afflicted by, it doesn't mean that they're inferior in any way whatsoever. Rather, there needs some explanation. That's all he's saying. And the explanation can be partially grounded in genetics and partially grounded in aspects of environmental noxious stimuli. So it could be just the external environment, maybe the working circumstances, maybe the bad job that these people are working, etc., that contribute to this. So that's why he's saying, you know, we've ignored conceptions of race in modern science from the 1950s onwards in medical genetics for a very long time because it was seen as discredited. Um, discredited by physical anthropologists who study skull structure, who study physical anatomy of homo sapiens, etc. Um, it seemed to be discredited by mainstream biology and genetics. And Reich does agree with that, but he does say we can't throw out absolutely everything because there is still some minority 
meager part of truth to a notion of race and biology and genetics that needs explaining. We just need to do better science of it. We've avoided this topic for so long, and we're at risk of producing really bad science if we just completely jettison every component of race that could possibly be an explanatory factor in the distribution of diseases amongst different allegedly racial groups. So to paraphrase a few other passages in his 2018 book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, uh, Reich basically believes that it's plausible there could be a partial explanation of cognitive traits such as intelligence from genetics. He actually thinks that current technology is good enough um, to actually try to provide explanatory factors for this, whether it be CRISPR and gene editing, etc. But we just don't have a large enough sample sizes internationally. Uh, so if you want to learn more about this, watch my other YouTube video on uh, David Reich's book where I summarize a lot of these methodological debates. And to provide one uh, uh, direct quote from the book, the idea that not only are there substantial differences, but that they likely correspond to traditional racial stereotypes has no merit. Again, he is affirming very clearly that racial discrimination is has no basis whatsoever in modern biology. To quote Reich one very last time, what makes Watson's and Wade's and Harpending's statements racist, and these are contemporary uh, journalists and uh, geneticists and other social scientists, on uh, the topic of race and biology. What makes their statements racist is the way they jump from the observation that the academic community is denying the possibility of differences that are plausible to a claim with no scientific evidence that they know what those differences are, and also that the differences correspond to long-standing popular stereotypes, a conviction that is essentially guaranteed to be wrong given recent evidence from genetics. So again, Reich is sympathizing with people who think that there's going to be some connection, but that connection might actually be a lot weaker than what other um, uh, biological uh, racists or, or scientists or journalists or social scientists have to say about the connection between biology and race. All right, having taken a look at what biologists and geneticists have to say, both for and against certain biologically grounded conceptions of race, we now turn to various philosophers of biology and philosophers of race to see what they have to say. So when we talk about philosophy here, you might think, well, why do we care what philosophers have to say? Don't they just sit in rooms and think about stuff and pontificate without looking at scientific evidence? No, that is not the case at all. Academic philosophers are going to be people who specialize in foundational or conceptual questions, and they're typically very educated in the particular social science or natural science that they are a philosopher of. So we're going to be looking primarily of the work of Keishon Spencer, Adam Hawkman, and Cheeky Jeffers. So these are going to be three professors of philosophy who are tenured. So the first we're going to look at is Keishon Spencer. So Keishon Spencer is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the philosophy department. And Spencer actually defends what he considers a modest biological race realism, specifically with applications to medical genetics. So he has a kind of similarity or affiliation with that of David Reich in that sense. Um, so he's going to have a view in which biology and, and medical statistics and cladistics in particular is going to be taken very seriously as evidence for some mild conception of race realism. So to begin to understand Spencer's view, we're going to look at a direct quote from a recent paper of his published 2019. To quote, Ship et al., which is a study, divided mothers into Asian, black, white, and unknown. So there's going to be four different racial categories here. Next, the authors found that the EIF rates, that is echogenic intracardiac focus rates for Asian, black, white, and unknown mothers were respectively 30.4% for Asians, 5.9% for blacks, 10.5% for whites, and 11.1% for so-called unknowns. This is really important because as you can see, the number for Asians is a lot higher. Given the sample sizes for each race, it falls that the average EIF rate for the sample was 12.1%, which is much lower than the 30.4% seen in Asian mothers. In fact, with Asian mothers, it's actually twice as much frequency. So according to a so-called frequentist interpretation of the probability of an event and the results from the study, suggests that the probability of having an aneuploidal fetus given that an EIF is observed on the mother's second trimester ultrasound image, uh, call it the probability of aneuploidy given EIF, is 1 out of 59 or 1.7%, and that the probability of having an aneuploidal fetus given that an EIF is observed on an Asian mother's second trimester ultrasound image is less than or equal to 1 out of 14. Um, in other words, approximately 7.1%. Now, that's just a lot of medical information I just threw at you. Okay, so I'm no expert on this myself, but what I understand to be the general point at which Spencer is making is that the frequency of EIF rates for Asian mothers is significantly higher than that for any other racial category. This is very important because 
um, having an aneuploidal fetus um, is more likely to confer um, a genetic mutation that can lead to things like Down syndrome. Okay, and so obviously we want to avoid Down syndrome. Now, this is not to say that we should practice negative eugenics and we should prevent Asian mothers from having children. Nothing like this follows. No, we're just saying that there seems to be a salient um, correlation between one's Asian racial categorization identity, um, whether it be, the, in this case, the, the Asian mother identity, and the presence of harmful diseases and that are um, constructed and are a result of the genetic material and genotype um, that one has inherited the DNA from. And so this is just one example that Spencer is using um, in where medical genetics has a really important role to play in racial categorization. This being said, like many philosophers of science, uh, Keishan Spencer is drawing upon an interdisciplinary approach here. So he's not just looking at medical genetics. He also wants to look at common usage of words and the political context of racial categories in order to provide a more holistic and sophisticated theory of race. So he asks, how do we get about investigating heterogeneous concepts of race and whether they're justified? Okay, so we're going to need to look at multiple different fields, social sciences and natural sciences, in order to have a more holistic uh, theory that's going to be adequate. So the conditions of adequacy for his view are going to begin by looking at the OMB definition of race. So to refresh your minds, um, OMB is an acronym for the Office of Management and Budget as part of the U.S. Census Bureau. And the OMB defines race as into the following five categories. I know I, earlier I said six, but we're going to focus on primarily five for now. We're going to put aside Hawaiians. American Indians is one, Asians is second, Blacks is third, Pacific Islanders is thir uh, fourth, excuse me, and Whites is fifth. So Whites includes non-Hispanic Whites, so that includes everyone from Egypt to Spain to Finland to England. Um, Spencer claims that the taxonomy of racial categories in the OMB definition is arguably justified through not only self-reporting for jobs, but also self-reporting for government, medicine, mortgages, childcare, etc. And the OMB legally mandated all federal agencies to use its definition since 1977. So that information is based off a 2019 paper that Spencer wrote. So from 1977 all the way to at least 2019, things may have changed in the past two, three years, but I don't think they have, all federal agencies in the U.S. government are legally mandated to use the OMB definition of race. Now, just because they're legally mandated does not mean that it's justified. There are many things that have been used throughout the history of humanity, whether it be impositions of slavery, whether it be impositions of racial category, whether it be impositions of mental illness and disease. It used to be the case that homosexuality was considered a disease, for example. Just because the federal government or scientific elites um, have been using something doesn't mean that it's always justified. Okay, And in this case, the OMB definition actually has been subjected to numerous criticisms, as we've seen before. So don't just go and naively think that, oh, great, the OMB has been using it for a long time, therefore it must be good. No, there are many problems with this definition, as we're about to see. Before we get to discussing the problems, though, we have to be a lot more careful in understanding how exactly Keishon Spencer is persuaded of these findings. So he claims that a criteria for an adequate account of some term T... Uh, so term being, in this case, uh, the term or notion of race, uh, three criteria have to be satisfied. One is that ordinary speakers intend a term T to refer. Um, by referring, I mean, when I say Asian person, I can point to me and say the word Asian is, in, is accurately referring to this person, that I'm a member of the class of all Asian people. Secondly, ordinary speakers intend the term T, that is whatever racial term that they're using, to refer to the same object that a group of experts on T intends T also to refer. So that's a very precise and, and kind of lawyer-like level of precision way to basically communicate the point that when I am being referred to as a Chinese Canadian national, that experts who happen to use those categories as well, such as uh, perhaps um, medical practitioners here in Toronto, Canada, where I'm living, uh, that they also intend to refer to people like me as being Chinese Canadian nationals. Now, um, it could be the case that uh, it, it, that this criteria is not satisfied. Perhaps the ruling scientific or social scientific elite are using phrases and terms very differently than average people are using them. Maybe they're referring to black people homogeneously as black when there's many differences. There's, there's people who are of Jamaican origin, Trinidad and Tobago origin, people from Ghana, people from Botswana, people from Angola, people from Senegal, etc., etc., etc. And so that, that diversity is not captured by the intellectual and medical elites. So it's very important that, according to Spencer, in order for a racial category to be considered legitimate as a term, ordinary speakers intending T to refer to the same object that a group of experts 
auntie also intend T to successfully refer. So there has to be agreement between what the experts say and what average people say. And thirdly, ordinary speakers agree on what T means. So that's really important because if I'm going to use a category like black or Asian or white or Native American, ordinary speakers also have to agree in order for there to be an adequate conception of what racial categories mean. Now that's a lot of philosophy I just threw at you guys. And it's really important that I throw all this philosophy at you because it gets you to see how difficult it is actually to have an adequate conception of race and any social category whatsoever. It's really challenging. You gotta make sure that ordinary speakers are intending to refer. Secondly, that ordinary speakers are agreeing with each other what the reference are of these racial category terms. And thirdly, that there's harmony between the semantic reference of what average people are saying and what the experts are also saying about these racial categories. Unless you have all three of those things, Keishon Spencer thinks that you don't have an adequate conception of race whatsoever. As Spencer continues in the paper, he actually thinks that all three conditions are actually satisfied. So to quote his paper on the 2010 U.S. Census questionnaire, there were 299.7 million respondents and a whopping 93.8% self-reported one or more OMB race definitions, while just 6.2% reported some other race. So this is a social scientific survey study that has been conducted in 2010 uh, by the U.S. Census Bureau through the Office of Management and Budget that claims that 93.8% are actually self-reported within one of the five extant racial categories that were provided by the OMB survey definitions. And that's really important because that's saying, look, people were given six choices the original five OMB choices to self-identify as race, and then just like a generic category as some other race. And it turns out 93.8% of respondents, uh, responding from a massive sample size, this is close to 300 million respondents, there are approximately 330 million Americans, um, that 93.8% of that massive sample size are agreeing to actually use and self-identify each of those five categories from the OMB. So what does that mean in plain English? That arguably means that, well, people actually do believe in races and they actually self-identify cleanly into one of those five different categories. On the 2000 U.S. Census Questionnaire, which is the most recent one that collected data on Arab ancestry in particular, 80 to 97 percent of Arab African, um, excuse me, Arab Americans self-reported as white. So that might be very surprising to you, especially given the history of, of racist policies, whether it be at airport screenings or um, propaganda or, or other kinds of concerns in the, in the Bush administration um, after 9-11, uh, etc., that as many as 80 to 97 percent of Arab Americans are self-reporting as white. And um, it makes you wonder, is that adequate? How do you make sense of that? Um, it seems really confusing. It seems really problematic. It seems like it, how can you make sense of all the, all the racism that Arab Americans experience if they are self-reporting themselves as white, and yet people clearly don't think that they're white, and they don't categorize them as white? Um, but Spencer thinks that, well, look, um, it's not going to be a perfect match between what the intuitive conception is of race and what the uh, average people think of race and what medical experts think of race and what social scientists think of race and what government officials think of race. There's not going to be a perfect correlation between all these different conceptions of race, but there's a lot more harmony than you might think. And that's why he thinks that th these survey results are actually not that strange if you consider the OMB definition. The OMB definition is sufficiently robust enough to make sense of this data. That is, if you believe that there are races, then you can make sense of this. If you don't believe there are races, it's really unclear how it is that you can make sense of these survey reports. This all being said, Spencer does admit that a 2013 study entitled The Alternative Questionnaire Experiment, um, conducted again 2013 by U.S. Census Bureau, suggests that the, the racial terms used are, are too vague. Secondly, that there's no consensus amongst respondents on the terms as reference. And thirdly, respondents need more guidance from the OMB. So what this is saying is that even though Spencer is citing studies that suggest that there is agreement between average people, medical experts, social science experts, and philosophers on the notion of race that's being used, um, there also seems to be other later data published 2013. So the previous data was on 2010. Three years later, the U.S. Census Bureau conducted another study suggesting that actually there's more disagreement than we thought. So I'm mentioning all these studies because it shows you that this debate is extremely complicated. It's so, so complicated, okay? Um, there are going to be moments where 
experts are going to agree. There's going to be moments where experts disagree by collecting new data, by scrutinizing other methodologies, maybe having interdisciplinary exchange, maybe what the economists were thinking was clear, maybe what the sociologists thinking was clear. But when they pool data together and they go to a conference and they, they have a debate with each other, then they realize, oh, actually what we thought was the case is actually not the case. So I'm mentioning this because it shows you the complexities of the epistemology and methodological disputes that many social scientists and natural scientists have when it comes to constructing race. So Keishon Spencer, even though he does defend a modest biological conception of race, nonetheless um, admits that the, the situation is a lot more complicated than just a clean-cut biological racism. And in fact, classical conceptions of biological racism seem actually not to be defended. Uh, that's exactly Spencer's point. That's why his conception of biological race realism does not entail classical racism in the sense uh, that David Reich is also attacking. So, you know, the idea of discriminating black people against black people, or discriminating against Asian people, or discriminating against white people, or discriminating against Native Americans, uh, that has no biological basis, um, is the claim. So um, Spencer does admit that there are a few other problems for his view. So to quote, he admits that all current human populations descend from a single population of about a thousand odd people that resided in East Africa about a hundred thousand years ago. So recall uh, David Reich's finding in figure five in a previous slide that I discussed in which there was a population bottleneck happening about a hundred thousand years ago where there's about a thousand odd people that are responsible for a massive surge in, in, uh, in, in humans um, giving birth. Um, all humans had dark skin until about 40,000 to 60,000 years ago when we first left Africa and found ourselves in environments with low ultraviolet B light. Together, these two facts imply that all living humans, every single one of us, to quote Spencer, descend from black skinned people in Africa. And thus, all of us are black according to the OMB's definition for black. That is, the OMB never calls race a kind or a category but rather always calls race a set of categories or population groups. So not an individual kind or category, but a set of groups. For instance, the OMB calls race a set of categories six times in a policy document entitled 97-28653. This observation leads me to believe that the meaning of race in OMB race talk is just the set of five races used in that race talk. So again, he's trying to do a bit of sociology here, a bit of philosophy, a bit of biology. He is drawing upon multiple disciplines to provide a critical analysis and scrutinize different concepts of race as used in the OMB definition. So given all these issues, Spencer's kind of more concluding thoughts on this is that we need a new conception of race. Okay, so just like David Wright called for a new conception of race, uh, Keishon Spencer also thinks we need a new conception of race such that it can avoid problems with classical definitions and it can avoid um, problems of racial discrimination, etc., and yet can still make sense of medical genetics and other social scientific surveys. So he responds as follows. He says that, look, an entity E is biologically real only if E is useful for generating a theory T in a biological research program P. Secondly, using E, that is referring to that entity E, to generate T, is warranted according to the epistemic values of P to explain or predict an observable law pertaining to that of P. That is a research program within um, the, uh, the, the program P. Thirdly, P has coherent and well-motivated aims, competitive predictive power, and frequent cross-checks. Okay, that's a lot of analytic philosophy I just threw at you. So let's work through this in a bit more detail because that's probably a lot of mumbo-jumbo technical jargon that you're like, whoa, whoa, I don't understand what's going on. So let's work through this slowly, because I think we can make this a bit clearer. What he is saying is that racial categories and concepts and entities are biologically based, that is biologically real, only if they can be useful for certain biological research programs, whether it be in cladistics, medical genetics, or epidemiology. Secondly, Using that conception of race to generate a theory, T, is warranted according to the general values, knowledge-based values that help the research program, P, whether it be in medical genetics or cladistics, to explain or predict an observational law pertaining to um, the entity E. So if the entity E in this case is going to be something like we're trying to explain why African-American males are disproportionately affected by prostate cancer, then um, insofar as there exists a... Um, Research program P, such as medical genetics, trying to explain the existence of this phenomena of uh, prostate cancer, uh, then E has some basis insofar as E can help one to generate observational laws pertaining to regularities observed in data sets pertaining to African-American males. And thirdly, 
that research program is coherent and well motivated. Okay. Um, and it has competitive predictive power. That is, its predictive power is going to be stronger than that of other antecedently held biological theories in medical genetics. And third, there's frequent cross checks. So there's a rigorous peer review system amongst medical efforts, to, um, excuse me, medical experts debating these findings in medical journals. And there's a check and balance from government. And there's like citizen science, etc. So as you can see, it's, it's not that easy to biologically ground an entity. We want to have a system of thought that allows us to have rigor and cross checks and competitive predictive power in order for us to have any biological basis for a conception of an entity E. So this is very general. Notice that he doesn't use the word um, uh, race anywhere here in particular. Obviously he's talking about race. He's gonna apply this framework to race, but this is a very general philosophy of science set of criteria that Keishon Spencer wants to uh, educate on, us on or to basically claim um, that is necessary for, in order for us to have a biological basis for any kind of socially constructed entity whatsoever. So why does Spencer think this? Well, he thinks again that the OMB definition satisfies these criteria and we can look at so-called cladistics data. I'll show you a graph on the next slide, but before I get to that, we're going to mention that from a sample of about 1,048 um, uh, people from 52 different ethnic groups around the world, Human DNA uh, can be divided into sex chromosomes, non-sex ones, and mitochondrial DNA. And then analyzing these three different kinds of human DNA, uh, a so-called K equals 5 partition of genetic clustering is empirically supported. So he's basically claiming that if you look at medical genetics and um, so-called cladistics, uh, which is a subfield of, of genetics, that you can actually partition the entirety of the world's people um, into five different groups. So I apologize that in this slide, it's really hard to see this cladistics data, but I'm going to try to walk you through this. So as you can see at the very top, you have K equals 6, K equals 5, K equals 4, K equals 3, K equals 2. So you have five different columns, and each column um, is represented by its partition and way of grouping people up into distinct groups amongst all human alleged races. And so what you have on the horizontal um, uh, parts of this index here are the geographical and ethnic origins of the people on the left-hand side. So you have, for example, Bantu, uh, Kenyans, uh, Yoruba, uh, Russians, um, French, Italian, Tuscan, etc., etc., etc. And on the right-hand side, you have the continental locations. So Kijan Spencer provides this figure in his 2019 research paper trying to argue that actually, look, if you look at the shading that is the colored shading of each of these units along each single clade, you can see that there's actually relatively homogeneous shadings for each continental group. So if you look for Africans, you'll see this kind of light grayish shade at the very top. Then you have this darker region extending all the way from Europe through the Middle East to Central Asia and South Asia. So all those people are sharing genetic material is basically what the claim is. Or they're at least not sharing entirely identical genetic material, but they have large overlap in genetic material. So again, just to restate that, those at the top portion of the figure are people of African descent and they're sharing largely genetic material. Then you have people sharing genetic material from Europe all the way through Middle East to Central and South Asia. Then the next group you have is East Asians. That's why I have these blue arrows pointing to these groups. And then you have Oceanians and then you have people in the Americas. So notice that the K equals 5 partition, which is represented by this red arrow diagonally pointing to the second from the left column, that the K equals 5 partition has the most clean kind of partition. You know, it's not perfect. If you look um, just around Middle East, which is the second blue arrow, you see that there's a little bit of gray amongst the darker um, shading. And you're also going to see that amongst Oceanians, there's also a little bit of lighter gray that's in it. If you look at the second from the bottom uh, blue arrow. So it's not perfect, but you notice that K equals five does a lot better at grouping up these people into distinct groups than does K equals six or K equals four or K equals three or K equals two. So notice that K equals two has this darker um, shade running along from Africa, getting more prominent into Europe, getting even more prominent along Middle East, Central Africa, and getting even more prominent, almost uh, completely um, obfuscating uh, the graph on the East Asian column. So we mention this again because if you were looking at these data sets and you wanted to group people up into different races, um, the thought is that, well, you could have six races, K equals six, you could have four races, you could have three races, you could have two races. But if you do that, you're not going to find a cleaner way to map out the distribution of genotypes. So that's why Keishon Spencer thinks that actually K equals five, that is that there are five different races. That seems to be the most genetically supported view about how to divide up races. 
And furthermore, this coheres very well with the OMB definition of race. If you recall, the OMB definition of race has five, though there's kind of this optional six category of, of Hawaiians, but it has five major races that correspond roughly to the groupings that you see here on the figure. To quote Spencer furthermore on this, K equals five partition is empirically robust because in particular, Rosenberg et al., which is a study he's citing, K equals five result has appeared in approximately 70% of all human genetic clustering studies that use a worldwide sample of human ethnic groups. To quote another study that Keishon Spencer is relying upon, Trevor Pemberton et al. 2013 have also obtained Rosenberg et al.'s K equals five result using the largest and most diverse sample of human ethnic groups to date. They used 5,795 people from 267 distinct ethnic groups from all over the world, including dozens of non-isolated populations and hundreds of mixed people such as African Americans, colored South Africans, Latin Americans, and Polynesians. So this shows you that there seems to be meta-analytic evidence, that is evidence pertained from that of sub-genetic studies um, that kind of are collated into a single study. There seems to be meta-analytic evidence um, from looking at multiple studies that the K equals Five partition has some empirical support. So to conclude Keishon Spencer's view overall, Spencer's view is that the OMB definition is conceptually adequate because it satisfies the two philosophical um, definitions of criteria that he provided earlier. Uh, secondly, it doesn't justify racism in any way whatsoever. He's very clear on this. Thirdly, medical genetics currently has great utility for a concept of race though just not a classical conception of race. It has to be a very novel conception of race. And fourthly, race is distinct from ethnicity. That much is very clear from the genetic evidence and also anthropological evidence. We turn now to a discussion of a philosopher at Dalhousie University named Cheeky Jeffers. Cheeky Jeffers disagrees with Keishon Spencer. Cheeky Jeffers actually thinks that races are thoroughly socially constructed and they actually have little basis in biology. Uh, that is, he doesn't deny exactly these medical findings. Rather, he thinks that this isn't a basis for a notion of race. He doesn't think that it's there's any, any usage in having this race. And he actually thinks that there's actually harm to having a conception of race. So he'll defend a cultural constructionism view about race as opposed to a political constructionism view about race, which we'll discuss in just a moment here. So the definition of race that he wants to operate under is as follows. Firstly, the concept of race is the concept of a group of human beings distinguished from other human beings by visible physical features of the relevant kind. Secondly, the concept of race is the concept of a group of human beings whose members are linked by a common ancestry. And third, the concept of race is the concept of a group of human beings who originate from a distinctive geographic location. So notice that this philosophical definition that Jeffers is providing is actually really similar to the definition that we started this YouTube video with. So go back to that earlier definition where we had five different notions and criteria that are required in order for there to be a classical conception of race. So the classical conception of race was defined along five criteria. Jeffers' criteria is actually along three different axes. Despite providing a definition of race, he nonetheless thinks that there's nothing significant, either positive or negative, that follows from this definition. And he thinks that's a really good thing. Um, he thinks actually that the history of biological race is saturated with claims about intellectual, moral, and personality characteristics, and the biological defenses of race end up with counterintuitive conclusions. It would be more accurate to represent Koreans as sharing a race with Germans and people from Thailand as sharing with a race with Fijians than to represent these two somewhat similar looking peoples of Eastern Asia as sharing a race with each other. And in fact, that's actually empirically supported. So I'll give you one example. So one example I can think of off the top of my head is that there's actually strong genetic and anthropological evidence that the people of Madagascar are actually genetically descended from that of the people in modern day Malaysia. So I'm going to say that one more time. Modern day Madagascari people are genetically related to that of modern day people in Malaysia, even though they haven't interbred um, much in thousands of years. So that shows you that geographical locality and closeness isn't any grounds for thinking there's genetic similarity. It's super counterintuitive to think that Madagascari people are genetically related to that of Malaysians, but the genetic evidence is like super clear on this. You can like look this up yourself. Um, so that's what Jeffers' point is, is saying that if you want to do what Keishon Spencer did, have this K equals five genetic partition, you're not actually going to be in a position that makes any common sense view plausible. You're going to be like, what? How is it that Malaysians and Madagascari people are part of the same race? 
uh, that doesn't seem to make any sense. They don't share similar cultures. They don't look similar, et cetera, et cetera. But that is exactly Jefferson's point. You cannot use intuition whatsoever. Intuition is not a reliable guide to social science or to natural science. Any social scientist and natural scientist can tell you that there are many counterintuitive findings all the time in the natural and social sciences. And that's why science is so powerful. Science allows us to rigorously analyze our common sense assumptions, test them, and to see if they have any basis in evidence at all. And in many cases, they don't have any basis. And that's exactly Jefferson's point for biological conceptions of race. As I said earlier, Jeffers advocates a so-called cultural constructionism view over a political constructionism view. So we're going to have to take a moment to do a lot of very careful philosophy here to make sure that we understand the distinction between cultural constructionism and political constructionism. So political constructionism goes as follows. A group G is racialized relative to context C if and only if members of G are, firstly, observed or imagined to have certain bodily features presumed in that context C to be evidence of ancestral links. Secondly, who's having these features um, uh, and marks them within the context of the background ideology in C as appropriately occupying certain kinds of social positions. So whether it be a social position of privilege or that of subordination. And thirdly, um, who's satisfying one and two plays or would play a role in their systematic subordination or privilege in that context C, that is, who are along some dimension systematically subordinated and satisfying one and two plays a role in that dimension of privilege. So let's go over this very slowly now that I've given you the basic overview. Let's use a concrete example. So according to the political constructionism view of race, what it is that makes someone racialized is their role in a particular political power struggle or political class um, uh, situation in context. So according to the political constructionism view, which is not Jefferson's view, it's actually Sally Haslanger's view at the University of um, uh, MIT, so Massachusetts Institute of Technology in their philosophy department, Sally Haslanger has a view that is basically similar to this, which is saying that, um, well, a good way to think about races and what makes how we can make sense of racist discourse and racial discrimination, all these horrible things about stereotypes, is that um, race is real insofar as it's a socially real thing, even if it's not a biologically real thing. And it can explain um, why it is that people continue to discriminate against Latinos, Asians, uh, Mexicans, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because if you think about race as having um, very specific cultural and specific political contexts and relations of social subordination and privilege, that is a better way to see race than the biological conception that David Reich, uh, Adam um, uh, Templeton, excuse me, gave to you, that Cooper gave to you, and that Kishon Spencer is defending. So the uh, political constructionism view is, in Sally Haslanger's perspective, a much better way to understand the current race politics and debates than is the biological view. Now, Jeffers is going to actually disagree with Haslanger on the political aspect and is instead going to defend a cultural constructionist view, which we'll describe on the next slide. So Cheeky Jeffers's cultural constructionism view says that it accepts political features of Haslanger's view, but emphasizes how culture shapes our conception of racial features. So Jeffers is making um, not just a normative, but also a descriptive claim. He claims that his conception of race makes better sense of people's intuitive conception of race. And secondly, he's saying that we ought to adopt his conception of race as opposed to Haslanger's view or Spencer's view or David Reich's view. To quote, as a result, one normative implication of my position on race is that we should be orienting ourselves in the present toward the eventual achievements of a world in which races exist only as cultural groups. So he rejects biological essentialism and naive hereditarianism about race. So that is, hereditarianism is the view that genetic uh, determinism uh, determines all aspects of our personality, intelligence, our beliefs about the world, etc. So genetics cannot fully explain all the psychological and anthropological characteristics that human beings have. So one objection that Jeffers responds to is say, well, wait a second, doesn't this just confuse race for ethnicity? After all, what makes cultural constructionism about race different than just simply the notion of ethnicity? After all, he accepts the political features and he's emphasizing how culture shapes our conception of racial features, but isn't that just what ethnicity is? So Jefferson's reply is basically this, to quote, races are groups distinguished at least in part by shared ancestry and distinctive physical appearances. Ethnicities are groups distinguished by shared ancestry and by cultural factors like language and religion. So you can have people who are in the same race, but not in the same ethnicity, because ethnicities have to share language and religion as well. 
So that's how Jaffers is defining race as distinct from that of ethnicity. To continue further, he says, an Afro-Cuban individual may love being a Latino and yet simultaneously take great pride in being of African descent, with the result that she feels a strong sense of kinship and shared cultural ownership with witnessing or participating in forms of culture originating in sub-Saharan Africa or in places in the African diaspora outside Latin America. So hopefully that helps you to see a bit of the distinction between Hasslanger's view, which is the political constructionism view, and Cheeky Jefferson's view, which is the cultural constructionism view, and how Jeffers thinks that ethnicity and race are actually distinct anthropological and social scientific concepts. The last philosopher of biology that we're going to look at on the topic of race is Adam Hockman, who's an Australian academic. He says that if race were a valid category, it should function like a subspecies. Remember Templeton's thoughts also on this. But there's no empirical support for classifying humans this way. To quote Hockman's paper, we are all about 99.5% genetically identical, and only about 5 to 15% of the 0.5% of genetic variation is unique to the populations conventionally called races. This is significantly lower than the often used standard of 25% threshold for a subspecies division. So what does this mean? He's saying that, look, ethologists, zoologists, and biologists define a subspecies to exist only if there is more than at least 25% genetic variation amongst that group of organisms. In the context of alleged races, if there were to be such a thing as race, we would need to see at least that much difference in genetic material. However, Hockman says that looking at genetic studies, we are all about 99.5% genetically identical, and only about 5 to 15% of that 0.5% of genetic variation is unique to the populations conventionally called races. Therefore, Insofar as races entail a subspecies definition, and insofar as subspecies definition is not satisfied by humans, it follows that the race definition is also not satisfied. Therefore, there aren't races. This is what Hockman is saying. Just like the other philosophers that we've seen so far, Adam Hockman does not shy away from criteria. To quote, we should reject a postulated scientific kind if all three of the following conditions are met. A, a radical change in definition is proposed. B, the postulated kind is trivialized. C, a successful alternative theoretical system with new terminology is introduced. As he says, biological race realists A, radically redefine race so that it is no longer synonymous with subspecies, which B, trivializes the concept, and C, ignores the fact that population genetics provides an alternative language to describe groups. Conferralism is also false. So conferralism, according to Hawkins' definition, is the view that we ought to distinguish between races and groups mistakenly believed to be races. So Hawkman's tentative conclusion is that race has no basis because subspecies has no basis for that of human beings. This being said, um, some anthropologists believe race realism is essential to combat racism. After all, how can you not believe in race if you believe that racism exists? So this is what Hawkman is responding to, and many anthropologists are aware of this problem too. But empirically, the notion of race is still problematic for public purposes. And he cites numerous studies. So he says to quote, research has shown that most non-specialists about race still understand race as a biological property and that such an understanding of race is highly correlated and linked with having racist attitudes. So you can actually look at these other studies to see how this is the case. So Hawkman's thought here is that, look, he understands that Keishon Spencer is well-intentioned. He understands that David Reich is well-intentioned. However, if we take too seriously medical genetics and self-identified conceptions of race from the OMB definition, then it turns out that empirically, if you look at social psychologists who study race relations and racial beliefs, that actually it's going to be the case that if you adopt a certain conception of race, that is the conception of race that they're defending, this modest biological realism about race, if you actually accept that view, and if you believe in that, you are more likely, and people in general who are less educated are more likely to actually adopt racist attitudes. And so you're actually going to be led to biologically indefensible positions about racism if you end up adopting those kinds of views. So this is why Hawkman thinks that we just have to dispense with these views altogether. We actually have to avoid conceptions of race wholesale. So he's even stronger than Cheeky Jeffers. You might look at Cheeky Jeffers' view and think, okay, that's kind of a modest view. That's not actually that radical. He's saying that there's, so long as we can talk about shared ancestry and shared culture, etc., that these salient features are enough to distinguish race from ethnicity and that that conception of race is nonetheless socially real and important. But Hawkman says, no, we shouldn't even have that. Because if you accept that much, it turns out that empirically there are studies that suggest that people end up adopting racist attitudes and racial discrimination beliefs if they adopt even something kind of like Jefferson's much mod more modest um, cultural constructionism view. So to end with some concluding remarks from Hawkman, to quote, the idea that race is sometimes real and sometimes not real, 
real in some senses but not others, is quite a complicated message to send to the public. It risks being misunderstood. The view that races do not exist but that racialized groups, that is groups falsely believed to be racist, do exist is much more straightforward. So what he's saying is he grants that there exists racial discourse. That much is obviously real. People use the notions of race. That doesn't mean it's justified. And secondly, we should probably stop racializing groups. That's, that is groups falsely believed to be distinct races. So Hockman's view is to synthesize a number of different views. He synthesizes the strengths and weaknesses of Chief Jefferson's view. He synthesizes the strengths and weaknesses of Sally Haslanger's view about political constructionism. And he synthesizes the genetic and uh, biological race realist views of Keishon Spencer and David Reich. And he shows that, look, we can make sense of all of those points from the other philosophers and medical geneticists while also noting that um, the existence of racialized groups is quite harmful for uh, political reasons. All right, everyone, that's the end of our discussion today. So to summarize, can biology support racism? Well, it depends on what you mean by racism and it depends on what you mean by race. On nearly all definitions, however, that we've discussed today, and these are mainstream definitions, biology shows racism is highly unjustified. In fact, there are hardly any academics in the entirety of biology, anthropology, sociology, economics, soci um, psychology, etc., that think that typically and classical notions of racism are justified racial discrimination. This is not to say that there are no differences whatsoever, as we've seen from Reich and Keishon Spencer. There seems to be some evidence from cladistics and medical um, epidemiology that suggests that the distribution of diseases is somewhat correlated with races. But that being said, as we've seen from Jeffers and Hawkman, there's no agreement about what race is and to what extent it's actually a useful concept, whether it's harmful, whether it actually is as biologically based as it seems to be, etc., etc., etc. Another conclusion you should take from this discussion is that folk psychology of racism is mistaken. So a lot of people's common sense intuitive conceptions of race are totally mistaken. I hope that much is clear. Lastly, there's no clean mapping of racial categories onto genotypes. So as you saw from the figure from Keishon Spencer's cladistics data, even the K equals 5 partition has problems. Even if it satisfied the OMB definition and even if it satisfies Keishon Spencer's criteria for when an entity is biologically real, it's nonetheless the case that there's a lot of disagreement about how to think about all this. So I hope today's discussion has been enlightening, interesting, and useful for you to think about race and race relations. Um, if you're interested more um, in learning about this, I encourage you to look up these academics that I described. You can find their papers online, hopefully for free. If not, you can email me uh, in the description box below, and I'll happily send you their academic papers. Uh, in fact, I think each of these people that I surveyed would be more than happy for you to email them, to ask their opinions, and to share your opinions. Uh, this is not an endorsement. I'm not saying that you should flood their inboxes, but I am saying that we are here to understand race in an intellectually and academically rigorous fashion, okay? So if you do find Find yourself interested in this feel free to email them feel free to email me and uh yeah i hope you learned something today